I have believed my entire life that we were on the precipice of a transformational change. And I have dedicated my reporting for all these years to digging up the evidence that I'm not making this stuff up. We started The Laura Flanders Show, the project that became The Laura Flanders Show in 2012. It was a moment not unlike this one, where it seemed to me that the rotten wiring of our economy had just been laid bare for everybody to see. Who could avoid it, right? 2008, the financial crash had showed us just how much damage can be done by a system in which a few people with no conscience at all are willing to do absolutely anything to make themselves and the people they work for just a little bit richer. And a whole lot of people are so desperate that they'll do anything at all simply to put a roof over their kids' heads. By 2008, we had already seen indigenous people from the bottom of this continent to the top put their bodies on the ground and said, there will be repercussions for polluting and poisoning our relatives. And we had seen that trickle down doesn't work. And when the damage to our planet started, seeing, started appearing very real and the floodwaters rose in New Orleans, we could see crystal clear that a rising tide does not, in fact, lift all boats. By 2008, we had seen, it seemed to me, everything that was wrong about the system, right? And people were talking about capitalism in a way that I hadn't heard in decades. We had uh, millions of immigrant young people saying to the president, you ran on a politics of hope. Well, our hopes and our dreams matter too. And you had seen, in urban centers all across this country. People raised, young people raised on generations, on a decade of propaganda about greed is good, camping out in our streets with the rats to call out the 1%. It seemed to me that we were on a tipping point, right? Like one of those kind of, I don't know, Wizard, in Oz, Wizard of Oz, Dorothy moments where little Toto rushes over to the curtain and it gets pulled back and we see that the big scary wizard is actually not so powerful. He's just a funny looking guy, a bit scared in a fancy suit with a very big megaphone. So I'm there at that moment in 2012 and that's when we're starting the show and I'm thinking, something's got to give, but it didn't seem like anything was given, giving. And, and in fact, Taunt Toto was having a kind of tussle with that curtain. A whole lot of forces wanted to say that we were recovered, that um, the economy was returning back to normal and that normal was good. And at just the moment I was beginning to doubt myself and think, well, maybe the system is better wired than I thought. I was in my studio, which at the time was in the old Air America radio office, a big Gilded Age building that took up a whole city block in Manhattan and Chelsea on 6th Avenue and 20th Street. And I'm in the studio and I can't hear anything and I can't see anything and we're about to start recording. Um, and a young person, the youngest person on my team, comes in and says, what are you still doing here? Oh, we forgot you were here. You gotta leave, the building's on fire. Everybody else has left. So it was winter and we evacuated in our, in our puffy jackets and uh, found out later that it had been a transformer fire and what happens in New York, the snow and ice and they melt the snow and ice with salt and the salt goes down into the gutters and it goes down through the grates and it can often ignite um, the electricity wires that are down beneath. And this story seems so far-fetched to me that when I had a chance I went and I looked at the hole where the fire had happened, the transformer hole. And sure enough, you look in there and it's just a mess. There's wires and cables and the sewer and the subway and a whole lot of pipes. And I said to myself, this looks like this is held together with duct tape. But being a reporter, I decided to test my, um, my hypothesis and we convened a, a show to bring on the experts to tell me what was actually the state of our system, our, our infrastructure there in New York at the center of Manhattan, the rich, one of the richest places on earth. And we brought in somebody from Con Edison, a real expert, and somebody else who had investigated exactly this. And, and I said, um, well, tell us, you know, um, what's the story? And they said, well, you know, this is a very old place and the system wasn't designed for this many people and actually, it's pretty much held together with duct tape. <laughs> so at that point, I thought, enough said. I got on my metaphorical bicycle and I uh, 
went to go and do the reporting about the changes that I knew were really out there and that people would get excited about if only they got a chance to hear about them. And that's when we started The Laura Flanders Show and we say it's the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. And the kind of people that we reported on are like the healthcare workers, largely immigrant women of color in the Bronx of New York that have the country's largest worker-owned co-op providing health care and providing the workers living wages and a share of the profits. I went down to, all oh, I heard about, um, the Thunder Valley Cooperative Development Corporation, Community Development Corporation, that was recreating an economy on Pine Ridge by reconnecting people, digging deep into their own sense of themselves, their spirit, and their place. And I went down to Jackson, Mississippi, where I was reminded by the great first mayor, Chokwe Lumumba, a graduate of the black power and civil rights movements, that the original movement for civil rights coupled the demand for a role in our democracy with a demand for economic empowerment. 40 acres and a mule. And he pointed out that you could never have had that march from Selma to Montgomery if it hadn't been for black land, where people could stay without being shot. And you could never have really had the registration movements of the 60s and the civil rights movements if it hadn't been for Fannie Lou Hamer and land trusts that enabled people to have a place to, to live and to work and to um, get fed when they were evicted for registering to vote. So with all of that, I also got interested in something I heard happening in Cleveland, Ohio, where a cooperative laundry had got started using local credit that was available for them to get a leg up, and a contract, a long-term, very good-looking contract with one of the biggest spenders in that city, which was the biggest hospital system in Cleveland. And people like Ted Howard and others were calling this a community wealth-building initiative, and they were describing a system where the biggest spenders in the place invest locally so that wealth can be broadly spread and deeply rooted. And that story was a fairly small story at that time. It was just one business, just five people, living wages, but nonetheless, it was a story that had a spark and a story that had potential. And with a little help from me and the totos of the world, that story spread. And it got all the way to the UK and another town, about 300,000 people, called Preston, that was similarly deindustrialized and feeling pretty burnt out. It once upon a time had built airplanes and trains and cars and had been at the heart of the Industrial Revolution, but now it was just chasing big businesses, begging them to come in, offering all sorts of tax incentives to start um, to, to employ people in Preston, and pretty much like clockwork when those incentives ran out, those businesses did too, taking everything that they had made with them. But a guy called Matthew Brown, who had just been elected city councillor there in Preston, had worked for many years in the benefit office, and he could see the problem. He had spent years handing out small checks to poor people and seeing them come back week after week. And he got himself elected to the city council, and he invited Ted, Ted Howard and the folks at the Democracy Collaborative to come to Preston and to do an analysis. Was this place really as poor as it looked? And they discovered, no, not at all, actually. 750 million pounds was being spent every year by the, just the top four businesses in that place. The trouble was all but 5% of those pounds were leaving Preston and going elsewhere. The profits and all the benefits and everything was just bleeding out. So with the help of TED and with the help of the Democracy Collaborative, a kind of think and do tank based in Washington DC, he decided to try to emulate the Cleveland model but do it on a citywide scale in a city of about 300,000 people, put the weight of the city behind this idea and this project. And he put the money into the city money, into local credit unions that have as their mission to spread it about, not sit on it. And he got the biggest employers, the healthcare, the education, the police, and the town to put their money, their contracts into local businesses and into inclusively held local businesses, if not public ones and union ones, then worker-owned co-ops. And he got them all to commit to a living wage. And very soon, changes began to happen in Preston, and you started hearing talk about the Preston model. And I called Matthew Brown the other day, he's now the leader of the council, in, a, in the last election when people of the Labour Party took a drubbing all across the country. He actually increased his majority in Preston, and people are pretty excited about what he's up to. And I asked him yesterday, does he have anything to indicate the progress that's been made, and he sent this video. Check it out. 
The Labour Council is doing something quite different here. We're quite a transformative Labour Council. We're taking control of our city. We're investing directly in our community. We're building stuff that's going to be city owned so we can all benefit from it. We're making sure that the wealth that we do produce does ripple through local companies, get a real living wage. We're also doing more to tackle the cost of living crisis and provide new affordable homes. Change has always come from Westminster politicians. What you're going to see in this video is how Preston Labour is working with communities to bring about transformative change around the Preston model that's benefiting many people right here, right now. We at the Preston City Council and the, the, the Labour Group made a decision to support the, uh, the involvement of uh, the Music Venue Trust in, uh, in purchasing the ferry. Uh, I think it's important that you know we have live music venues like this. Bands and musicians use this place to learn their craft, and it's sort of the place where touring bands come through, and people can see those bands, you know, without having to travel to a another city. It's great to see that um, so many people got behind this campaign, and it's a great. Um, new way of looking at, at, at venue ownership, um, taking it back into, into the community instead of being owned by private landlords. I run the Mandala Yoga and Wellbeing Centre. We've recently um, started the process of becoming um, employee owned, becoming a cooperative because we really believe in community wealth building. From our perspective that's about this place being a community asset. Tower in Preston has been in operation for over 30 years now and its main aim is to upskill um, South Asian women and uh, in particular around uh, the agenda of employability. We are getting large institutions and organisations like the National Health Service and FIRE as well to come into community organisations and share Sort of employment opportunities. We're outside this wonderful Emmanuel Church in the heart of Preston and we're looking at uh, making this building into 14 affordable homes as well as uh, lo local church for the local people. It's showing not only that Preston Labour and Preston Council are listening to the public but they want them to be involved because they believe as I do that they are the experts in this area. I'm involved in the Preston Cooperative Education Centre which is a new initiative in Preston and it's been formed as a union cooperative. One of the things that I want to say is how grateful we are and pleased that the Labour Council in Preston has invested in a cooperative education centre. Preston is one of the places that really gets this. You can't say that about necessarily other councils. For many years now in Preston, we've been doing things a little bit differently to most places. We try to protect public funds and keep them in the locality as much as we can. We are committed to tackling um, climate change. We are trying to ensure that you keep as much much money as possible in your pockets, spending it locally and boosting other businesses here in Preston. As you've seen in this video, we're making big changes in Preston. So please back Labour on Thursday, May the 4th, the party that's going to deliver change. So if, if you know anybody in England or in Preston that's voting in the city council elections, you can share that video with them. It hasn't been all smooth sailing for Matthew Brown. Um, he had the Labour Party's real support, the National Party's support, um, and a lot of media coverage uh, when I first went over there in 2018. It's been harder since. But the story has grown. In Cleveland, community wealth building in, in that city has grown from one business with five employees to seven businesses and 250 employees. The story of Preston got people in, excited all over the United Kingdom. The governments of Wales and Ireland look poised to dedicate themselves to building this kind of an economy and in Scotland they actually have declared that the purpose of their economy is to create well-being and they have created the first the world's first minister for community wealth building The administration in this country, the US, the Washington, you know, DC administration hasn't been a slouch on this either, actually. And although there is much we could say to, of complaint, it is also true that there is a community wealth building agenda written into the budget of HUD, Housing and Urban Development, that the CHIPS Act that was passed in 2022 requires those who are contesting for those contracts to make CHIPS 
to commit to investing locally and hiring people locally and putting some resources in the local places where those factories are built. It's not perfect, but in a very few years, without any big support, you have seen a phenomenon, a story called community wealth building that isn't about a band-aid, but is instead about a full spectrum revisioning, rewiring of our economy, grow from a spark to something that is really spreading as an idea around the world. And it can be adapted into every place and every community. But we are, it feels to me, back in another one of those moments where, for heaven's sake, we just saw a million people die. We saw hundreds of thousands of people leave the workforce and we're being told that everything is all right. We've seen how brutal our racist, sexist, colonial state can be when it comes to anyone stepping out of very limited lines. We've seen how many people with power get away with how much, and how eager and how easy it is for a few with a very big voice to pull that curtain back, because that's, of course, what they'll do. If you're a media organization that is funded by the people that pollute and poison and profiteer, what else are you going to do, for heaven's sake? You're not going to cover the stories of transformation, of new ideas. You're not going to carry that spark. You're going to be in that fight with Toto. But I believe in Toto. And I am on Team Toto. And I want you to all be on Team Toto, too. So think about your own community media wealth. What's the media that tells the story that gives you inspiration and hope? What's the media that isn't the ABC network, which is all of them, awful, bad, and commercial, <laughs> but instead media that doesn't dispirit you and discourage you and disconnect you, but gives you some sense of your place in this community, on this planet, and some sense of your power? Support that media. Thank you so much.